During the early 1900s, Texas is going to become more involved in world politics because the United States is going to become more involved in world politics. The United States is going to become a major player in world affairs, and Texas is going to be a part of this, starting with, in 1910, with the Mexican Revolution. It becomes very heated. Porfirio Diaz had been the dictator of Mexico for several years. Diaz will be overthrown by a man by the name of Francisco Madero. Madero will then make himself dictator of Mexico. Other groups want control. There's other people that some people want it to be a democracy, other groups that are fighting, and Madero will then be assassinated. This leads to fighting amongst these different groups. And by 1915, a man by the name of Venustiano Carranza is going to become president of Mexico. And Carranza is going to make Mexico a democracy. The United States likes that. And the United States will recognize Carranza's government as the official government of Mexico. But not everybody, all of the revolutionaries are going to give up at this point. Two men, or two groups, one led by Emiliano Zapata and the other led by Francisco Pancho Villa, continue to fight. And these two groups are still fighting. Uh, Pancho Villa, in March of 1916, will invade the United States. He will cross over the border with 500 troops and he'll attack the town of Columbus, New Mexico, taking supplies and killing several people. Uh, he will then raid into Texas in May of 1916, and the United States says, uh, hey, wait a minute, this is an attack on American soil that uh, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson will declare Pancho Villa an outlaw, and Wilson will send General John J. Pershing and the United States Army into Mexico to arrest Pancho Villa. Pershing will take 6,000 American troops with him, uh, but the thing is they will do this without the Mexican government's permission. This is going to anger the Mexican government, and actually that the U.S. sent troops into a foreign country without that government's per permission could be seen as an act of war. And so that's going to create tension and bad blood between the United States and Mexico. For 10 months, Pershing will chase Villa around Mexico, but he'll never catch him. Villa actually gets away and becomes a huge hero to the Mexican people for eluding the United States, uh, especially to a lot of Tejanos. Villa will become a hero. Meanwhile, while this is going on, Europe is having its own problems. In 1914, Europe becomes entangled in World War I. And there are several causes of World War I. One is nationalism, which is the belief that one's country is better than every other one, like every other country, just because of who they are. Um, so also you have militarism within the countries of Europe is a buildup of large modern armies and weapons. And so it, tying that with nationalism, these countries have these new weapons and they want to use them to go prove that they're better than everybody else. And then all the, we have a whole system of treaties and alliances between all the different countries in Europe, where if one country is attacked, then this other country is bound to defend it. And so what that's going to cause is one event is going to pull all these other countries from all over Europe and all over the world into a, a war. The one event that will take place that will set off all these treaties and alliances and cause World War I is the assassination of Franz Ferdinand. Franz Ferdinand was the Archduke of Austria-Hungary, meaning he was the next person to be emperor. He and his wife, Sophie, were visiting the city of Sarajevo, and as they were there, a Bosnian Serb will come up and will shoot them and kill them, will assassinate them. Uh, with that, then, that sets off all these treaties and alliances as Austria-Hungary declares war on Bosnia, and then everybody else's treaties kick in, and it creates our two sides. On one side, you have the Triple Alliance, which is Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire, which is present-day Turkey. On the other side, you have the Triple Entente, which is France, Great Britain, and Russia. And this is going to be the largest war uh, to date in world history. It's going to take place in countries and continents all over the world, which is why it's called World War I. Uh, at the time, it was called the Great War or the War to End All Wars. And they will have two fronts. The Western Front, which will take place in France, where the fighting will be. And then the Eastern Front, which is in Russia. The war starts in 1914, but the U.S. does not immediately get involved. Because so many immigrants had come to the U.S., the United States tried to avoid taking sides. As a result, by proclaiming our neutrality, the United States tried to trade with both sides. 
uh, each of the groups, the Triple Alliance and the Triple Entente, are going to try to keep the United States from trading with the other person. Uh, this is going to lead to different troubles. One event is what's known as the sinking of the Lusitania in May of 1915. The Lusitania was a British passenger ship that was smuggling weapons from the United States to England. Uh, it is sunk by a German U-boat, which is a submarine, and it kills everybody on board, most of whom are civilians, including several Americans. Well, the United States gets angry and threatens war if submarine warfare doesn't stop. So Germany's going to back off of submarine warfare uh, against the United States. But by 1917, the U.S. is trading more and helping mostly Great Britain, and so the uh, Germany wants to stop that, so they start sinking United States ships again uh, to try to stop supplies going to Britain and France. Also in 1917, an event known as the Zimmermann Telegram takes place. The telegram came from the German foreign minister, a man by the name of Zimmermann, and it was sent to the government in Mexico, asking Mexico to attack the United States. The coded telegram was intercepted, it was translated, and it was published in the newspapers, and what the telegram said was if Germany would attack the United States, then after the war, if Mexico attacked the United States, after the war, Germany would help Mexico reclaim the American Southwest, everything Mexico had lost in the U.S.-Mexican War. This is going to anger Americans. They feel that um, now that they are specifically under attack, and as a result, by April of 1917, the United States will declare war on Germany and will officially enter World War I. With the U.S. part of the war now, it has to get ready. The U.S. will quickly mobilize Texas is going to be a major part of this mobilization. It's going to be a major location for the training of troops. During the first war is the first time that we see airplanes used in combat during World War I. Uh, South Texas is going to be a major place for Air Force bases because the land was so flat, it gave the planes a place to land if they got in trouble. So we're going to see the rise of a lot of air bases in Texas. Uh, Kelly Air Force Base in San Antonio is a major base for training pilots. 200,000 Texans will serve during World War I, and 450 women will serve as nurses. Overall, 370,000 African American troops will serve from all over the U.S. Uh, this will be a, uh, the Army is segregated still, that the troops will be, and the African American troops will be in segregated units commanded by white officers. Some of these soldiers will be stationed at Camp Logan in Houston, uh, which will lead to a major event in August 23rd, 19, uh, 1917. The Houston police will arrest and beat an African-American soldier for refusing to move to the back of a streetcar. Uh, the news will reach the camp that this soldier was beaten, and then the rumor will spread that the police actually killed him, and this will, which did, he did not die, but he was beaten and arrested for refusing to... Uh, uh, move to the back of the bus, and as a result, it will lead to a race riot where the soldiers will attack the town. 19 people will be killed. 110 African-American soldiers will be arrested and found guilty of mutiny and rioting. Uh, several of them will be executed, will be hung by the U.S. Army. The rest will be sentenced to life in prison. Uh, also during the war, hundreds of Mexican-Americans will serve in combat, several winning medals, and four Texans will receive the Congressional Medal of Honor during World War I. Uh, the war's effort, effect on the soldiers, 5,000 Texans will die in the war. Uh, physical wounds were very common. Uh, a very large portion of the men will suffer some form of physical uh, result, a loss of limbs, things like that. In Europe, one-third of the male population will have a physical effect from the war, from get poison gas or bullets or bombs or something. There's also psychological trauma. This is the first time as a, a world that we start to analyze the psychological impact of war, where they talk about somebody having shell shock, uh, what we would now call post-traumatic stress syndrome. And one of the other events we see is what's known as the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918. This is a massive global pandemic disease of the flu that's going to affect, that's going to kill hundreds of thousands of people. More people will die from the Spanish flu that died during the entire war during World War I. Uh, it will last a year. It will affect everything and, and create this major pandemic and fear in the United States. 
during the uh, during the war, the big impact for Texas is or on Texas is what takes place on what's called the home front. As part of mobilization, the government has to pay for it, and one of the things that the U.S. government will do is issue war bonds. A war bond is a loan from civilians to the government to help pay for the war. We also see the rise of aid organizations, specifically the Red Cross, which will provide medical aid, and the Salvation Army, which will provide physical aid. Uh, they're more, most famous for popularizing donuts, that the Salvation Army would go and cook up donuts and give out to the soldiers. Uh, one of the things to get supplies to the soldiers in Europe, the United States will institute rationing so the people at home did not get or only got a limited amount of sugar and wheat and fruit and vegetables and cloth and things like that so the supplies could go to the soldiers so that we see the rise of what are known as victory gardens. Uh, these are gardens people plant in their yard to help with their own food that they can grow food for themselves to eat so the government can send the large supplies of food overseas. Uh, one thing that happens uh, that's negative because of the war at home is that we see an anti-German prejudice, an increase in prejudice against Germans because the United States is fighting Germany. A lot of this is connected with a group known as the Committee on Public Information. This was a government agency that was designed to create propaganda to get people to support the war effort and to sell war bonds but as their posters and things came out saying negative things about Germany and about Germans, it leads to anti-German prejudice and violence in the United States um, that will carry over this anti-foreign prejudice after the war, too. Well, the war comes to an end uh, in 1919. 1920 is a new period in American history that we refer to as the Roaring Twenties, as a transition. This is a period of dramatic change in American society. It's the first time America is an urban society, that more people will live in cities than live in rural areas. The U.S. economy is going to grow. It's going to be dominated by a couple of factors, one of which is called mass production. This is where factories produce a lot of goods very quickly and make them inexpensive. And so people all over the country will buy the same items and that they're inexpensive allows the, or the companies realize that they can sell a whole lot more at a cheaper price and make a whole lot more money. We also see, because of this mass production, what's known as consumer culture, that owning lots of items becomes a status symbol. And so what you owe and what brand of item you own is going to become important. Technology is going to change people's lifestyles. New appliances are created that are meant to save time and effort. The biggest one is going to become the car. Uh, the automobile is a uh, uh, becomes a necessity. It's not a up until this point, automobiles had been a luxury, a symbol of the rich. Now everyone, a car is just a necessity that you have to have to get to work to get around, and becomes a symbol of this. We also see a change in entertainment. It's this is the period where movies, specifically Hollywood, becoming multi billion dollar industry, and the movies are going to shape tying it back into the consumer culture are going to shape what people wanted to buy, what they wanted to wear, because they're going to base their image off the stars they see on the uh, movie screen. And also radio is going to become a national media. Radio is our first national media. It's going to create a uniform national culture that everybody will listen to the same shows on the radio, the same commercials exposed to the same ideas in the news. Uh, we're going to see other changes in 1920, with the passage of the 19th Amendment, women now have the right to vote, so women are going to become more involved in politics. Miriam Law Ferguson will be elected the first governor of Texas, or first female governor of Texas. Annie Webb Blanton will be elected secretary of public education for Texas. And Jane McCollum will be elected Texas secretary of state under two separate governors. Uh, women's groups are going to get the state to pass laws that limited child labor, that created a state board of education to govern the school system, and are going to bring about health care and prison reform. Other changing social values involve young people. Uh, young people in the 1920s are going to challenge traditional culture. With cars, young people are now able to go out. Uh, up until this point, a date would have been the boy going over to the girl's house and sitting in the front parlor with her whole family while they talked, now the couple can go out. They can go to clubs. They can dance. 
Uh, they listen, the young people listen to jazz music. They're going to smoke. They're going to drink, which is illegal because of prohibition. But all of these events are going to happen. And the symbol of this new changing values is what's known as a flapper. A flapper is a young woman from the 1920s who challenges conventional style. She'll wear short dresses that stop just above her ankles, uh, have her hair bobbed so it's shorter. The women will dance. They'll go to clubs. They'll smoke. They'll read and talk about things. They'll go to college. All that's the image of the flapper, which challenges the traditional what roles for young women. One of the things we see in the 1920s, though, is an increase in racial and ethnic discrimination in Texas and the United States. Uh, African-American and Mexican Texans are continued to be discriminated against in the state. And one of the things we see in Texas and throughout the South, but in Texas also, is the rise of the Ku Klux Klan to power. The Ku Klux Klan that was around during Reconstruction will come back during the 1920s. It will build off of the anti-foreign sentiments, the feelings that came out of World War II. And now the Ku Klux Klan is very violent. It is a white supremacist organization, and it's going to focus on everything that is not what they feel is white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. So they will target Catholics, they will target Jewish people, as well as African Americans and Mexican Americans. They will target immigrants. And uh, the Klan at this time will claim that they're fighting for morality, but they're going to use that moral argument as a way to just use violence against others. Uh, they will use that violence to gain control of Texas politics. They will dominate state and local politics during the early 1920s, including having governors who are supportive of them. Uh, Miriam Ma Ferguson, her election in 1924 as the first female governor of Texas, but also just as governor of Texas, is very important because her election is going to break the Ku Klux Klan's control over politics in Texas. But even after they're out of, tex out of politics, Texas is still going to have one of the highest numbers of lynchings in America. Texas is going to have the third most number of lynchings in the United States. One of the impacts of the economy during this time is on the oil industry in Texas and just the growth of industry in Texas. During the war, uh, the U.S. economy is going to boom. The government will set fixed prices for goods because the military needed stuff. So no matter how much somebody produced, the price was going to stay the same. So farmers are going to produce a lot. Manufacturers are going to produce a lot. Uh, they're going to make a whole lot of money. Farmers will bring more land into cultivation because they can grow more crops and they know they're going to have a set price. After the war, though, the government will stop setting prices. Farmers had overproduced their cotton, and as a result, cotton prices are going to plummet. To maintain their income, farmers are going to then produce more cotton to try to maintain a standard of living, which increases the overabundance, the oversupply, and causes prices to continually to drop. Uh, for farmers in rural areas, they're going to face hard times. Most farmers were tenant farmers, and so they don't own their own land. Um, landlords made the tenant farmers grow cotton because cotton was the most profitable crop. Most tenant farmers were poor, uh, a very high level of poverty, very poor diets, limited education for their children. And so this is going to exist, especially in West Texas, in the rural areas <clears throat> during this time that's seen as a period of prosperity. But for farmers, it's not so great. Um, as a result, many rural Texans will move to cities during the 1920s. Uh, they will move to the cities looking for jobs. As they move to the cities, we also see manufacturing growth. Petroleum refinery becomes a key industry in Texas. Also, clothing manufacturing in places like Dallas, where the cotton will be turned into cloth and clothes. Um, oil will be the main source of rescue for the Texas economy. It was the main cause of economic growth in the 1920s. With the rise of cars, the demand for oil skyrocketed because people needed gasoline. The opening of the Houston Ship Channel in 1917 allowed Texas to ship its oil from refineries in Houston and Beaumont area to anywhere in the world. And so Texas is going to be a major player in the global oil market. Um, also, as more people begin to drive, the United States government is going to set aside money to build roads and highways uh, to assist with these cars. 
As a result, Texas in the 1920s will create the Texas Highway Department to build roads throughout the state, and major cities in Texas are going to continue to grow throughout the 1920s until uh, we have an event that will lead to the Great Depression of the 1930s. Thank you.